the customer wants to book a coach ticket. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully. Good morning. I'd like to book a coach to London. I was hoping you had something available this Saturday afternoon. Good morning, sir. Take a seat and I'll just check for you. Uh, yes, we still have several free seats for Saturday. Where will you be leaving from? There are three pick-up points in town, Main Street, Centenary Square, or the Central Bus Station. From Centenary Square, please. That's easier for me to get to than the bus station. And what time would you like to leave? There are coaches on the hour every hour, from 12 through till 6pm. Well, I'm meeting someone at the station in London, and I need to be there for 4.30. So, which one would you recommend? Hmm. Well, there's one leaving at 1 that arrives at Victoria Station at 4.10, if that's any good. Traffic is usually quite light at the weekend, and the drivers tend to make good time, so I think you'd certainly be there for 4.30. OK. That sounds just right. I think I'll take that. I can always phone ahead if I'm going to be late. And when are you returning, sir? Actually, I'm not sure when I'll be coming back, so I won't book a return ticket, just one way. I can always book you an open return if you'd like. You can use this at any time within the next month, as long as you contact us first to reserve a seat. Well, there's a chance I might be getting a lift back, you see. So I'll just pay for one way. I don't want to buy a return if I don't need it. OK, no problem. Are you travelling alone? Just the one ticket, please. I'm going down to visit my daughter at university. My son's meeting me at the station, so it's a proper family reunion. Very nice. OK. Well, I can book that for you if you like, sir. That'll be £23.50. Now, I just need to take down some details. Can I have your name, please? Yes, it's Matthew Upton. That's U-P-T-O-N. And your address? 34 Allersley Road. Allersley. That's A-L-L-E-S-L-E-Y. And your telephone number? 01732... Double five eight double nine seven. And your email address. We'll use this to send confirmation of your travel details. Matt257 at yahoo.co.uk. OK, thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. Before I forget, I'll be taking a little luggage. Is there a set luggage allowance? We offer a very good luggage allowance. You can take two suitcases as long as they're no more than 20 kilos each. That's 40 kilos in total and one small item of hand luggage on the coach. Most people find that more than adequate. Any additional items carry an extra charge of £10 for each bag. I certainly won't be taking that much, so I should be OK. I was worried I might be taking too much. Would you like travel insurance included with your ticket? It's an additional £2. No, I don't think so. No problem. It's not compulsory. OK. How will you be paying? Actually, I've been having trouble with my debit card today, and I've left my chequebook at home, so I'd better pay in cash. You'll give me a receipt, won't you? Certainly, and we'll send confirmation to your email address as well. So that's £23.50, sir. If you just wait a minute, I'll print you off a receipt.
That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of a lecture on art and culture in the Indonesian island of Bali. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Last week, we looked at the traditional art of Japan. In this week's lecture, we're going to move south and look at the very special way in which art has developed in the beautiful island of Bali, which is now part of Indonesia. I'll begin by giving you a brief historical overview. It's thought that the first inhabitants of Bali were farmers who arrived around 3000 BC, at the beginning of the Iron Age. They probably originally came from China, and in Bali they cultivated rice and built temples ornamented with wood and stone carvings and statues. The Hindu religion was introduced in the 14th century AD, and this has remained the main religion on the island. This was an important period in the artistic development of the island, when sculptors, poets, priests and painters worked together in the service of the ruling families. Rather than painting everyday scenes, artists concentrated on narrative paintings illustrating the epic stories of Hinduism. Bali's rich natural resources have always made it an alluring goal for merchants, and from the 17th century onwards, Dutch ships visited the island to trade in spices and luxury goods. Gradually, the old royal families lost their power, and eventually, in 1906, the Dutch East Indies Company was founded, and the island became a colony. In the 20th century, art then took on a very different role, as a tool accessible to everyone in the fight of the Balinese people against colonisation, rather than as the property of a minority. Shortly after this, in the 1920s, stories of the beauty of the island of Bali began to spread around the world, and Balinese art underwent another vast transformation with the advent of tourism to the island. At first, this was only on a small scale, but it had important effects. Expatriate artists from Holland and Germany settled on the island, bringing paper, Chinese ink and other new materials with them. They worked with local artists, encouraging them to experiment with concepts like naturalism, expressionism, light and perspective, as well as to move away from the traditional focus on narrative painting towards something closer to their own experience. When independence came in 1945, this desire for an art to match a new national identity became stronger and the traditional narrative paintings started to give way to scenes showing the everyday life of the Balinese people, harvests, market scenes and daily tasks, as well as the myths and legends of their history. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Many of the features that give this art its special place in the world today can be traced back to these historical roots. 
One feature that is rooted in the events of the last century is that today in Bali, the production and the appreciation of art is not restricted to a minority. In fact, there is a famous saying that in Bali, everyone is an artist. And it's not considered that to make art or talk about art, any formal training is needed. Art is just produced as part of Balinese life. Even fruit salad is served with flowers strewn on top. One factor which has contributed to this productivity is Bali's fertility. Over the centuries, the rich soil and the fact that food and shelter are readily available has given the islanders the leisure to develop their arts. While painting, sculpture, carving and music have traditionally been the province of men, women have channeled their creative energy into making lavish offerings to the gods with spectacular pyramids of flowers, fruit and cakes offered at the temples on festival days and celebrations. All these kinds of art still have close links with the religion of the people and are something that people do on a daily basis. Another special characteristic of art in Bali is that it is not generally seen as an individual pursuit. In the West, art is often carried out by the artist on his own, reflecting his own individual world view in the hope of achieving personal wealth and fame. For Balinese artists, art is something that's done as a group, and many artists may participate in one piece of work. And Balinese art is not restricted to temples and offerings. It decorates objects such as jackets, motorcycles, hotel menus and so on. But perhaps the most significant characteristic of Balinese art, and one that distinguishes it most from the art of the West, is to do with its expected lifespan. Carvings are made in soft stone, which is gradually destroyed over the years. The humid climate rots paper and cloth paintings. The magnificent offerings of fruit and sweets are eaten. Wooden statues are destroyed by insects. But Balinese artists accept that their work is ephemeral, not permanent, and instead of slavishly preserving the originals, they produce new art. And all this rebuilding, renovating and replacing means that the island's art continually evolves and perpetuates itself. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a student, Kayana, and a professor about an assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 27. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 27. Hi, Dr. Reed. Are you busy right now? Do you mind if I come in for a second? Hey, Kiana. No, I don't mind at all. Thanks. I just wanted to say that I'm enjoying your urban studies course and that I'm having some trouble with the first assignment. OK, no problem. What do you want to ask? This is my first time writing a paper of this length. All right. What sort of trouble are you running into? Well, writing more than 10 pages is actually turning out to be quite a task. I've been rereading some of the material, and I'm just not sure how to approach the assignment. Yes, it takes some time to get used to academic writing assignments. More time than I expected, really. I also want to do a really good job on the assignment. I don't want to put a half-hearted effort into it. I'm glad to hear that. I'll say that these assignments get easier to manage as time goes on. That's a small relief. I mean, it gets easier to plan the assignment and to organize one's time, but it still takes hard work and a sincere effort to produce a good piece of academic writing. My role is to guide you to the readings I think are the most relevant and to give you tips on managing your time. Okay, could we talk about the readings then? Sure. 
We can go over them. I guess I want to ask about the Cole House tax first. It seems like a pretty interesting book. But sometimes a bit over the top, no? I would recommend reading just the first part of the book. It's the most relevant to the assignment that I gave you. The rest of the text goes on about a topic we will cover later in the semester. All right, I'll just read the intro then. As for the Peely article, oh, did you read that one? Yes, I accessed it online and then printed it out. Okay. I would recommend you review that again. Also, remember what I said about the Leibskid article? I think you told the class to focus on the research methods, right? Yes. She approaches the problem in an innovative way. Let's see. For the Gary article, I think you should... Let me see. I think it would be best for you to read just the conclusion. Just the conclusion? I see. Yes. I would ask you to read the whole thing, but this way would be more efficient. Speaking of which, you should not bother reading the Wolfson article. Yeah, it didn't seem particularly relevant to the topic. Let's see. Any other reading you wanted to talk about? Let me see. Um, yes, the Cudler article. What do you think of that one? Ah, yes. How could I forget? That one is pretty central to the topic. I really think you must go over it again. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 28 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. All right. Is there anything else you wanted to ask about? Yes, I wanted to ask about the line graph that you provided. It seems that the legend identifying the different parts is not there. Ah, it must not have been photocopied correctly. Here, let me explain them. They all represent percentages of the population in Manassas, OK? Line 1 here at the top is the percentage of people who were born in a foreign country. Born outside the country. OK, and this one? The next line down, line 2 refers to the percentage of people with citizenship. All right, got it. Those making a middle-class wage are represented by the fifth line down. OK, middle-class wage earners. And the line number 4? That is the percentage of people with a college education or higher. All right, and the one in the middle? That one is the percentage of population who are married and have children. Got it. Thank you so much, Dr. Reed. I really appreciate your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture on cities of the future. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 37. OK, we've been looking at how societies will develop in the future and at the increase in the size of cities. So I want to talk to you today about the key considerations in these cities of the future. There are three key elements I want to look at, and these are the new features they will have, issues of size, and the main problems to be considered. First of all, individual transportation will be a big factor in these new megacities as public transport becomes unmanageable. There'll be a huge rise in the use of segways, which are personal transporters, like motorised scooters. As a result, and partly also to reduce pollution, roads will be altered so that they are narrower 
and will take up less of a city's space than they do currently. Naturally, this is a major change to the infrastructure, and something that may hinder it is the huge amount of investment it will require. The next thing is, what is going to happen to the commercial areas? We do not want these to become even larger concrete jungles than they are at present, so we have to look at design. And current designs for city development include building gardens on the roofs of these buildings to make a more pleasant environment for workers. And you may think that these areas will expand to cope with increased commercial activity. In fact, the prediction is that they will cover one-fifth of the area that they do at present as we build upwards. The exception to this is shopping centres, which we predict will expand with more and more temperature-controlled malls. What may cause difficulties is that the superstores will be confined to the outer edges of the city as they will be too big to fit into the new malls. Then, of course, there are the residential areas, and these will undergo their own changes. One particular development will be houses which are built from glass, as innovations in this material allow it to provide light without causing problems with temperature inside a building. The residential areas will not be allowed to expand without limit, as happens in some areas at present and their size will be restricted to a population of 15,000. One issue, which has yet to be resolved, and I'm not sure it ever will be, is how we manage to house older residents. They will be increasing in numbers as time goes on. Finally, how will these cities live? We know we have limited energy sources, so what will we do? Well, something currently in development, which will be a feature, is that waste is going to become an energy source. For example, to provide gas in homes. Also, as new technology and systems are developed, we will find that energy plants will become smaller. Another energy source we could use, but one which raises issues of having enough space and too much noise, is wind farms. Because of the problems, I'm not convinced these will be the grand solution to our energy problems that we thought they were going to be. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 38 to 40. Now, Moving on to looking at the social aspect of cities, we need to look at housing and how people will live. Cities currently have flats in the centre, populated by single people and wealthier residents, and families tend to move to the outskirts. In the future, the centre of cities will see a dramatic change. We will see many more examples of cooperative buildings. This is where people join together to form a company that owns the building they live in, and, despite continuing shortages, there will also be a rise in the provision of retirement homes in city centres so that the elderly can have easy access to hospitals and shops. Recently, we have seen a levelling off in the growth of private housing, and I think that will not change. But we are likely to see more social housing, as far fewer people will be able to afford to own their own homes. OK, now, if anybody has... Any That is the end of part four. Check your answers.